morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of ICC Securities. Uh, my name is Aditya Bajaj and my colleague Sagar and I will be your host for the day. We at ICSA Securities uh, sincerely hope you all are in the best of health, you know, you and your families. Uh, at ICSA Securities, our endeavor is to bring to you the best uh, researched and curated ideas. And uh, one such idea is uh, from the White Oaks table, uh, which uh, we will be uh, discussing today. Uh, we have with us uh, today one of the best minds in the investment industry, Mr. Prashant uh, Khemka. He's a founder at uh, White Oak Capital Management. Uh, he's uh, a city wire AAA rated fund manager and uh, brings with him more than 20 years of rich experience in the equity markets. Mr. Khemka was a CIO and a lead portfolio manager at uh, Goldman Sachs and is a PE mechanical engineer from Mumbai University along with an MBA in finance from uh, Vanderbilt University in the US. Uh, a very warm welcome to Mr. Prashant Kempa and the team at White Oak. Uh, sir, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aditya. Uh, very much appreciate the uh, organization of this call and want to thank you uh, at ICICI as well as all the clients who've taken the time this Saturday morning uh, to log into this call. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll start with the standard presentation uh, deck and we'll run through it for about half an hour and then open it up for questions of which I hope there would be many. So Nitin, who is also from our team on the call today, along with uh, Pankit and uh, Ayush, uh, they'll also be stepping in from time to time during the conversation and during Q&A. So we just last week celebrated four years of our, um, uh, since our foundation, uh, we manage roughly 31,000 crores or $4.2 billion. Um, uh, over 100 people at the firm now. The assets, as you'll see on the right hand side pie chart, about 84% comes from outside India, remaining from India. Uh, half of the assets are from global institutions like sovereign wealth funds, pension plans, and so on. 35% is from family offices and ultra HNIs like yourselves. And about 15% comes from uh, endowments and foundations and charitable trusts and uh, fund of funds and so on. The reason for the greater skew towards the foreign investors has great part to do with my personal background. So while I grew up in Bombay and started investing, fortunately, very early in life on behalf of my family, when uh, in 1985, the markets rallied 100% after Rajiv Gandhi became prime minister. Uh, at that time, I was like many retail investors have gotten sucked in over the last 12 months of a 100% rally. I got sucked in at the time as well. And since then, have always remained fascinated and hooked on to Indian equity market. Along the way, I went to the US for further studies. Uh, then joined State Street Global Advisors in Boston as portfolio manager for international equities, uh, managing developed markets, if you will. And then in 2000, joined Goldman Sachs and was soon made senior PM and co-chair of investment committee over there, managing for about six years uh, U.S. equities. And then moved to India in 06 to start Goldman's asset management uh, business led that for over 10 years and along the way also was made head of global emerging markets um, collectively built about six and a half billion dollars of business over there and then left in 2017 to start white oak over this time period of uh, 14 years that have professionally managed india uh, money uh, starting from march 07 uh, 10 years at Goldman and now four years, the team at White Oak. Uh, the team has delivered top-notch performance 
uh, of about 20% annualized gross of fees. That compares to little over 10% to 11% uh, performance of the market during this time. Um, so this performance has been delivered very consistently, uh, putting us not only as one of the top performing managers, uh, but also one of the most consistent performance during this time. What you see here is performance over the last four years uh, or nearly four years, starting from September 2017 of the team uh, from the first fund that was launched, which is a Mauritius based fund called India Icon Fund by the team. You'll see at the bottom of the left hand side table, 125% returns compared to 60%. So 65 plus percent outperformance on a cumulative basis, which on annualized basis means 24% return compared to 13 for nearly 11% outperformance. If you go to next slide, that shows that most uh, the performance has been generated in a very consistent manner. 12 out of 16 quarters outperformed, so 75% strike rate on a quarterly pace, though annualized its uh, outperformance in each year. So average 210 bips outperformance. Uh, four out of five down quarters we've outperformed, an average of so 80% strike rate and an average of 232 basis points, and eight out of 11 up quarters outperformed at an average of 200 basis points. So when the markets go down, the team goes down, less when the markets go up performance is stronger than the market all of this performance has come from stock selection if it would be evident from next slide this is the most important analysis of performance uh, that you must ask of every manager when evaluating performance this helps you distinguish between skill of the investment team and what might be luck factor uh, stock selection universally is considered more skill based performance. And as you'll see here at the bottom row, the team delivered 143% return. This is gross of fees and taxes uh, compared to 60. So 83% outperformance, of which 113 has come from stock selection, which is more skill based. And allocation effect, if anything, is minus 30. Um, Again, to remind yourself, uh, to remind you all, it's a gross of fee analysis. In each individual sub segment, large cap, mid cap, small cap, the team has outperformed very substantially. As you can see in the second column, the fund performance in each category, in the fourth column, the benchmark performance. If we go to next slide, same story repeats from when viewed from a sectoral perspective, all of the alpha has come from stock selection as you can see 85 percent out of 83 percent has come from stock selection that being positive in almost every single sector if you go to the next slide shows the top 10 names that have contributed positively to performance and top 10 detractors and we'll come to this slide more at the tail end and i assume there'll be questions related to this but just wanted to share some of the top performers and detractors Coming back to slide number six, to help uh, go over uh, or explain what we do, how we do to be able to generate uh, the performance that has been generated. In my view, it's a prerequisite to have a focused, strong investment culture, what we call performance first culture. Now, the sole driver for all of us is to generate the highest return compared to peer group for our investors. And it's founded on these four pillars, philosophy, team, process, and portfolio construction, which are aligned with one another. Meaning that it's a stock selection based philosophy of buying great businesses at attractive valuations rather than betting on macro. To go with it, we have the best team in the industry of stock pickers. Implementing a time tested process, something that you know, I've developed and has evolved over the last nearly 25 years. At the heart of which is our proprietary OPCO FINCO uh, framework, which we'll go over in a few minutes. And we maintain a balanced portfolio from a risk management perspective. 
with the aim being to avoid top-down bets and ensuring that performance is function of stock selection, as you saw a couple of minutes ago. Let's go over each of these for a couple of minutes. If you go to the team, uh, in the interest of time, if I were to highlight three key attributes that distinguish the team, uh, first, it's the most well-resourced team of highly seasoned investors. 18 people with an average of 10 years of experience. I believe it's unparalleled in the industry. There are several members here with multiple cycles of experience going as far back as the Harshad Mehta scan for some of them. So a deep bench, deep and well-resourced bench of seasoned investors. Second, extensive global experience. I myself mentioned earlier for eight years managed developed market money and for four years global emerging markets from Korea to Mexico, 30 different countries. During these 12 years, have evaluated more than 2000 companies outside India for investment purposes. That provides an unparalleled uh, pattern recognition perspective and a comparison set when evaluating companies in the Indian market. Um, and, and pattern recognition is an important element of decision making and, and analysis um, while investing. And not just myself, there are several others on the team, including particularly Ramesh and Rishi, who have extensive experience investing beyond India. Third, we have a unique team within team structure uh, where each stock and industry is covered at least by two individuals. So Ayush, who is here with us today, uh, covers technology sector jointly with Ramesh and Vishwa, Vishwa Metro. They jointly are responsible for primary research, idea generation, uh, company meetings, plant visits, where uh, applicable uh, financial modeling presentation to the team and carrying it through to decision making. This is very unique uh, as against the standard industry practice where typically one person covers one stock or one industry. So each of these three attributes, deep bench, extensive global experience and team within team structure are either unique to our team or uniquely strong on our team and equip the team to generate the kind of performance that it has generated. I'm going to request Ayush now to talk through the shared philosophy of the team on the next slide. Thank you, Prashant, and good morning, everyone. The shared philosophy of the team is that outsized returns are earned over time by investing in great business at attractive valuations. You may say that many other managers also see the same thing. See, investing is a centuries old profession and there is no silver bullet. The devil lies in the details and execution. Now, the two key pillars of our philosophy are great business and attractive valuation. In order to be considered great, we think a business should possess three key attributes. It should have superior returns on capital. It should be scalable and well managed in terms of execution and governance. And all of these three attributes are rooted in the fundamental value equation, which is that the value of any business, any asset is nothing but the present value of future cash flows. Or if you were to write it in the form of an equation, value equals cash flow divided by R minus G, which is the equation at the bottom of your screen. The first attribute, superior returns on capital, is a prerequisite for cash flow generation. Only when the return on capital is higher than the cost of capital is there potential for cash flows. And this is the numerator in the value equation. The second attribute, scalability, is all about sustainable growth. This is the G in the denominator in the value equation. The question that we ask here is, can the business grow multifold compared to the peer group and compared to the broader corporate universe at large? As you can imagine, all industries are not equally scaled. On one hand, you can think of print media, newspapers, which is already in terminal decline in most developed markets and likely to face the same fate here in emerging markets like India. On the other hand, if you think about the private sector, been at 20% plus over the last 20 years uh, on the back of a structural penetration opportunity, market share gains from public sector banks, and many other well-known factors. 
an example of a scalable opportunity. Once there is potential for the first and second attribute, which is potential for cash flows and scalability, you need a management team that can execute. Just like in the 1990s, there were many banking licenses that were given out, and all of them had the same attractive, structural, multi decadal opportunity ahead of them, but few of them went bankrupt or had to be bailed out, the likes of GTB and others, while few others have gone on to create tens of billions of dollars of value on the back of sustained superior execution. Including ICICI Bank, by the way. Yes. Now, a business may have all of these attributes, but in the absence of adequate corporate governance, it might be a great business, but only for the controlling shareholders and not for us minority shareholders. And therefore, assessment of corporate governance is the starting point of our analysis. In fact, that is the only screen which we run. Uh, as you might be aware, in the last few years, there have been many corporate governance disasters. Uh, and very happy to tell you the team here at White Oak has been able to steer clear of each and every one of them. Another aspect of our focus on governance is that so far, we have not found any attractive opportunities in government-owned businesses because not only in India, but globally, government-owned businesses tend to be synonymous with uh, a poor corporate governance and very hard to expect India to be any different. At the same time, in investing, we never say never and remain open to the idea that if privatization were to truly come through, there could be interesting opportunities that might emerge in government-owned businesses and uh, we are open to evaluate such opportunities. In order to assess these attributes and the governance DNA of any business, the team collectively does more than 2,000 meetings every year, not only talking to management at various levels, but also speaking with competitors, speaking to customers, suppliers, distributors, uh, industry experts, talking to ex-employees, you know, ex-CFOs can be very valuable sources of insight. Uh, to build a holistic 360 degree perspective, on these attributes and the DNA of a business. And once we find a business that has all of this in good measure, we think it is crucial to have a logical framework to value them and to buy and own these businesses only as long as they present a substantial discount to intrinsic value. And to that end, we are very disciplined. We are very sensitive about valuation. We are not in camp. It says that once a great business, uh, you can buy it at any price, you can hold on it forever. While there might be some merit to that argument, you might be able to uh, beat the market. You might be able to be above average, but we constantly remind ourselves on the team here at White Oak that our goal is not to be merely above average. Our goal is to be at the top of the peer group. And to that end, this discipline around valuation helps to add those extra few crucial percentage points of alpha that makes all the difference. At the same time, I must emphasize that while we're very sensitive about valuation, we do not look at some of the common used metrics uh, like price to earnings multiple or EV to beta multiple. We think that these metrics are distorted and can be uh, harmful if used for investment decision making. Instead, what we rely on is uh, DCF and cash flow multiples as derived from our proprietary cash flow centric framework, which we'll walk you through in the next slide. Now, this is no rocket science. Uh, we, this is merely application of well-established principles of finance and valuation in a way that we find useful to extract insights into the source of value creation in any business. At the heart of this is breaking down the value of a company into two components. One, which is a function of invested capital in the business and other, which is a function of excess return on invested capital in the business. Let us take a quick example. Uh, consider a tire manufacturing business. For analytical purposes, we would break it down into two components, a Finco and an Opco. The Finco on your left-hand side will own all the capital investments in the company. So it will own all the plant, property, equipment, machinery, and also all the working capital that is deployed is housed in this entity. On the right-hand side, Opco would be the operating company, the capital light operating franchise, which will pay for the use of these assets at the rate of cost of capital firm. So for the use of plant property equipment, there's an operating lease cost for the use of working capital. There is a working capital financing charge at the rate of cost of capital of the firm. What you would notice is that by design for Finco on the left hand side, the return on capital is equal to the cost of capital. Right? And the first principle of valuation is that if return on capital equals cost of capital, growth is immaterial. The value of such a component or such a business is nothing but one times book value or one times invested capital. Uh, 
we use a cost of capital of, of 11%. You invert that one upon 11. So this becomes a nine times cash flow multiple business, a low multiple business. You can call it dumb capital that is put in the business. On the other hand, if you come to the right hand side, Opco, after paying for the use of these assets, after paying taxes to the government, what you're left with are excess return, excess ROIC cash flows, because these cash flows are after paying for the use of these assets at the rate of cost of capital. And the present value of these cash flows is, in a sense, a manifestation or quantification of the excess return on invested capital in the business. So, a lot of managers talk about in wanting to invest in high ROIC business, high ROS businesses, and then they go and talk about price to earnings multiple. And there is a big disconnect because the price to earnings multiple or EV but tells you nothing about what is the value of excess return or invested capital in the business. Now, the value of the overall company is a summation of these two components. So if I can draw your attention to the bottom two equations on the slide, the enterprise values Fenco plus Opco or the value of invested capital plus value of excess return or invested capital. And importantly, unlike Finco, which was a low multiple business, this Opco can be a 20, 30, 40 or even higher multiple business, depending on the strength of the franchise and other aspects that we discussed earlier. Now, this component or the percent value residing in these two components provides us the first crucial insight into the source of value creation in any business. Let's take a quick example uh, from the tire industry. There are two businesses uh, which most of you will be familiar with, Apollo Tires and Balkrishna Industries. And a popular refrain in the market is that Apollo Tires trades at 12, 13 times PE multiple, uh, Balkrishna trades at almost twice of that, 27 times PE multiple, both are tire manufacturing businesses. This one is far cheaper, a more compelling, uh, more attractive investment opportunity. When we run this analysis for, uh, for Balkrishna and Apollo, what we find out is that for Apollo tires, 85% of the value resides in Finco, the dumb capital, low multiple business, and only 15% resides in Opco on the right-hand side, because they're not the best allocators of capital, right? For Pal Krishna Industries, it's the exact opposite. Only 15% resides in Finco and 85% resides in Opco because they're far superior allocators of capital. And therefore, if you look at the price to excess ROIC multiple, which is at the bottom of your screen, which is derived by rearranging uh, the enterprise value that we get from here and what the market provides us, uh, this excess ROIC multiple is nothing but the value of market implied excess ROIC divided by the excess ROIC cash that we have calculated for. Now this excess ROIC multiple for Apollo tires, while the P multiple was 1314, this cash flow multiple is close to 100. For Balkrishna Industries, while the P multiple was 27, the excess ROIC multiple is close to 35. So this is an illustration of how uh, we would have come to very different investment decisions by looking at the excess ROIC cash flow multiples. If you go to slide 23, on the bottom right, uh, you can see this excess ROIC multiple for the market relative to where the accounting earnings multiple are. Uh, for FY23, the price to earnings multiple for the Sensex is at 21.9 times, whereas this excess ROIC cash flow multiple is 35 times. So the idea here for the market as an aggregate, about 25% of the value resides in Finco and 75% of the value resides in Opco. So, so just to add, great. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Ayush. Finish your thought. Yeah. So the idea here is that the greater is the proportion of value that resides in Opco, the closer will be your earnings multiple to your excess ROIC cash flow multiple. Certainly. So rather than looking at a company's P multiple, like as Ayush was saying, Apollo tires. P multiple of Apollo tires might appear 10 to 15 times and hence appear very cheap compared to a market multiple of 22 times. Right. Uh, and also cheap compared to a Bal Krishna industries where P multiple may be 30 times and 30 times P multiple of Bal Krishna might appear expensive compared to the market P multiple and certainly compared to Apollo tires P multiple. When you look at the right P multiple being apples to oranges or apples to or, or lemons lead you to wrong decision making uh, or wrong input on valuation. But if you were to look at excess ROIC multiple or the OPCO multiple, uh, it would it would provide a much 
uh, more apples to apples comparison, and then it's up to you anyways to decide. But on excess ROIC multiple, Bal Krishna Industries would be more or less in line with the market multiple of about 35 times, whereas Apollo tires would be north of 100 times multiple and show up as far more expensive uh, a, a company, a business than Bal Krishna. So very opposite uh, to what P multiple might suggest. And similarly, there are other companies like, say, Prabhat Dairy compared to Nestle, while both are in food or Pratap Snacks, while both might appear in food related products, uh, which is what Nestle is as well. On P multiples, those would look very cheap, but on excess RYC multiple, they are actually far more expensive. While we are on this slide, so we've covered the team, we've covered the philosophy of the team and the OPCO FINCO framework, which is very central to our way of thinking and definitely uh, valuing companies. So how we value companies is very much aligned with how we think about uh, a business franchise. Uh, we've also covered bits and pieces of the process, but I would park that in the interest of time on process and portfolio construction. If there are any questions related to them, we'll get into those. But now let's move to portfolio composition, um, which is shown here at the end of last month, how the team had built the portfolio or had the portfolio composed. Uh, you'll see in the top half, it's the sectoral composition. We are invested across almost every sector except for energy and utilities. Um, nothing uh, that the team has from a top-down perspective against energy and utilities. It's just that from a bottom-up perspective, we don't find anything attractive to invest in. These are, mind you, sectors that are dominated by government-owned companies. Uh, and then there are other companies here, like obviously Reliance Industries is the big, big elephant in the room, if you will. Uh, there, it's a complex conglomerate. The team has always struggled with understanding the accounting and keeping up with the accounting of a conglomerate. A conglomerate accounting anyways tends to be very complex, and it's even more so in case of uh, um, reliance, and we don't find uh, you know anyone who can um, who understands uh, uh, it properly, and we've followed the discipline. What we can't understand, we can't um um you know value and if we can't value uh it's hard to make an investment decision on though it's a very important company in the indian scheme of things and we continue to follow it track it and and try and understand it better and never say never um on the lower right hand while this discipline might have hurt us in case of reliance over the last three four years as the stock's done very well this discipline has served us well across the rest of the market and the portfolio where it has kept us out of trouble uh, as Ayush mentioned earlier. If you look at the lower right hand side table, it shows the market cap composition. A little over half is in large cap and about 43% is in mid cap and small cap put together with about 31% in mid caps and 12% or so in small caps. And that's a reasonable mix for you to assume going forward as well. 30 to 50 percent in line with historical range would be in mid and small cap put together. Now we can go to the very last slide before opening up to Q&A, uh, just showing the top 10 names and detract uh, to bottom 10 uh, detractors. Uh, not to go into individual name right now, uh, but I would say that the contributors and detractors are both very well distributed. So no single name makes or breaks the performance of the team, which is what you'd like to see. And, and only then the performance is, is you know, reliable. Uh, the, the contributors are far larger than detractors, multiple times larger. In fact, the 10th largest contributor is larger than the top detractor. That's what you'll expect to see when performance has been as a good as it has been for the team. These names come from a variety of sectors and market cap segments. If there is a character of the portfolio that can be inferred from looking at these names at the risk of generalizing, it is that it's a portfolio uh, typically of companies that are either industry leaders like 
in the niche area of operation like InfoEdge, Naveen Florine, VIP, Dixon, Intellect Design, Bal Krishna, they're either industry leaders or gaining market share like the other names shown here. On the back of superior management execution, in doing so, they're not only growing faster than the peer group and gaining market share, they're also generating returns that are superior to the cost of capital and far superior to the cost of capital. And we buy these and own these as long as they, uh, we are convinced of uh, robust or more than adequate governance. And these names represent value as derived from our Opco Finco framework that Ayush went over just a few minutes ago. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all related documents carefully before investing.